chapter 10. I will start with some of the discussion points we had last time on the exercises um, and then finish it up. Oh, wait, I want to share my whole desktop. Okay. Okay, so um, the first three points here are the same. This last one I added here, I don't know if we've seen this collect function. Uh, I copied this from the help page. It turns a generator, so like when you create a range and it says range generator, into an array um, that you can index like a vector. Um, so they use that in some other code. Okay, so let me go to actually, so last time we talked about um, two point boundary value problems, we define them, the shooting method and differentiation matrices. And so let me go to the exercises. Uh, so we were discussing this exercise last time. Um, this is where we left off. So we, okay. we rewrote the different ma second different matrix function to a fourth order different matrix function. And we were discussing, remember this FD weights from chapter five. So I rewrote, after we discussed together, I rewrote it using FD weights everywhere. Um, and I realized I had some issues, so I had some debugging to do. So um, essentially I started, you do kind of have to know how many points how many weights you want from FD weights. So um, just based off the problem description, they said for first order derivative, um, there should be five interior points. So I'm getting the interior points here. Um, and this is the third node will be the first node that has all five interior points. So I'm subtracting off the third node and then it'll be the same um, on all the diagonals. Uh, then I had to have the boundaries, so the first and second node, and then the n and n plus one node um, have four, they have five weights. Um, and I had also changed the code. I had these um, changing with i here, but I don't think it should be. So I, I rewrote um, the indexing to not change with I for um, the columns. The rows should be indexed for I, but not the columns. And then it's the same thing for the second derivative. Uh, they mentioned in the prompt, that again, there's five interior points, and then you can just say you want second derivative from FD weights. And then for the, the boundaries, there's six uh, non-centered weights, so now I have six. The other thing um, you probably don't remember, but if you go back and watch the video, I also, the FD weights, you don't, it automatically um, scales by H, the increment size. So before I was doing it twice and all my scale, so every, all the scaling are messed up. But if you use FD weights, um, it's already scaled by the, Basing, so you don't have to worry about that. Okay, so we can look at it for this example. Um, so this is just illustrating the approximation for this function. We have the function, the true first and second derivatives. And um, this says I want fourth order differentiation um, with 18 n is 18 so there's uh, 19 nodes and x will be spanned from minus one to one um, so here's just a little preview the first derivative uh, first difference with fourth order it kind of cuts off but you see we have first the boundary in the first and second row and then now we have this um I didn't do sort of the rational thing, the what we looked at before where you can convert to rational. So essentially this is zero here, but um, okay. And then again with the second derivative. Okay, so we have, now we have six 
weights um, at the boundaries and five interior weights. Okay. And then we, oh, I figured, also figured out how to make my pots bigger. Well, <laughs> I made them bigger. Um, so this is the nodes. This is the fourth order approximation at the nodes and the blue line is the true, the exact. And if you go back, um, actually, let me pull it up. In the book, they do it for second order and where there are the curves, um, we capture it better with fourth order. So, no, this is not right, Toby. Okay, so I want you to pay attention here at the beginning and then sort of wherever it changes these uh, inflection points or whatever, minimums and maximums. Um, for second order, the error is worse than uh, with fourth order, they're kind of right on the curves there. Okay. Uh, and then we can see that with the error, now we have fourth order. This isn't really illustrated. I think this would have been more illustrated if I plot the second and the fourth together, but I, I did not. That's, the prompt didn't ask for that. I didn't do that, but here we have fourth order um, convergence. So again, the log log, the slope is four. Okay. And this is for the first and second derivatives. Okay. And then the other exercise we were talking about was um, for using whether using the shooting method in section 10.1 and then Ron was like well maybe they wanted us to use the built the BVP problem um, the ODE all that so I redid this exercise 10.1.5 with the um, functions they actually introduced in section 10.1 um okay and so some things that i had troubleshooted was for the shoot method you can give the domain like one you could have an integer here um but for bvp bv problem i was getting issues uh, i had to change this to 1.0 and then this was the problem that had the epsilon for different epsilon values. We wanted to solve um, the system. To use BV problem, we, fr we use the, um, these two, the setup. So we set up the ODE um, where the, um, this is the system of equations, F and U is the state. So remember, u1 is the state and u2 is the derivative of the state. Um, and this is the first and second derivative based on the problem. Um, and then we have the boundary conditions here. So this says the state at zero. So the first index is the state, right? So this says um, u uh, the first dimension of the state at zero plus one um, equals zero. That's that first boundary condition and so on. And then um, you set up with BV problem, you have to give this ODE, these boundary conditions, uh, some initial values, your guess, the domain, and then um, this is the parameter of the system, that, that epsilon. Um, let me see if I wrote down the, um, yeah, this, this is the system, remember. So epsilon is sort of some parameter um, of the system. Okay. Um, keep going. Okay, and I couldn't, this is something I was maybe going to going to ask both of you um, when you get this output of from solve 
it plots both components of the state, which is the the function that we're actually in, the state we're actually interested in u and its first derivative. So when you look on the plot um, for each value of the parameter, we get the we get two lines, one for the state and one for the first derivative. Um, so we really only care about this blue, green, and gold, and then the <laughs> first derivative kind of outweighs. Remember, this is uh the step function, I believe. So we we should be seeing um something that goes to a step function, but I don't know. And I wanted to ask. Can you just you know, select the component with like u of one or something like that? Or I did, but then it's only at um specific. Let, let me just show you how to show. Let me copy this. Okay, so like U is um this So you need like U of U, I guess. Yeah. Oh no, it's right. So U one thirty doesn't U one doesn't give you what I want. What if you just do use of one of one? Um okay, let me go up here. Yeah, and do it. I believe it was U one comma colon. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I think it's yeah. I did do this and then tried. Oh wait, I didn't open the plot again. Hold on. Hold on, hold on, let me copy this. <laughs> I remember I I did this, um, but it didn't quite. Oops. Oh my gosh, let me just go in here. Bring out that. Okay. Um, I think the reason why I didn't continue, yeah, then it was something weird like uh. this. So it wasn't quite right because now it's saying X is going like beyond. Oh, I think I know why. Okay, I think it's because oh, you need to go I'm not plotting it with the T too, yeah. yeah. So anyway. That's a uh, uh, let me just put it here. You would have to plot T and U. Yeah. Should should line four oh seven have something like U comma something so that it points to two objects like you uh change like u and u comma v equals solve bvp maybe, maybe it's like that but um let's see does it uh but we don't have to do it now no but yeah <laughs> yeah i'll just look i think i just copied this from I, here so i just did this so, yeah when you put the it. whole when you put the whole solution in it's overloaded for Right, it's multiple dispatch for that type of BVP solution, I guess to call that type. So it takes care of all that automatically. Um, I don't know if there's some additional arguments you can give to the plot function that'll pull out the mm. crazy. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll look into it for next. 
I, I mean, I, I know I've done it before and it's just been so long already. <laughs> <laughs> the whole, that was last year that I did that. So I can't expect to remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so anyway, here yeah. we go. Um, all right, so that was the first half of the chapter. Now the next half we have, um, the next section is co-location for linear problems. So co-location means that the location um, of where you want to, uh, essentially said the location of the unknowns and the approximations are at the same nodes. So essentially um, you have some places where you, I don't know, it's basically like regression. Uh, I, I don't know how to, let me, let me just go through these notes and then hopefully it'll make more sense. Okay, so we know that the two. Um, yeah, by the way, the, yeah, with the extra argument is I indexes, you just say IDX is equals like two and you only get this, you only get the second one, a sec extra argument to the plot. Okay, so I should here. Yeah, IDX is, IDXS, IDXS, yeah. Okay, I think we only want the first one, right? Well, yeah, I'm not sure which one, but I'll give you one of them. <laughs> if it's not there, we get the other one. I don't know if that has to be a sequence or not, but try it without. I think it's smart enough to know. Okay, yeah, there we go. Yeah. Um, I knew there was some way to do it. Thank you. The way it's way easier then. It doesn't look like what we expect though, right? <laughs> no, yeah. So these are not, these solutions are not good because they're not step functions. Or do, we, or do you want index two? Which one's the velocity it's supposed to be? Or the velocity, the derivative, first derivative is one. The right? second position. Well, okay. yeah, you should be right. Yeah. Okay, well, I guess there's something else wrong, but okay. It could just be that I, yeah, I have something specified here wrong. Or yeah. That the, the initial values are bad in the B, in this, and I don't know. <laughs> Okay. Okay, so going back, co-location. It the way it, it's just written down is harder to explain than just looking at it. Oh, so yeah. we have uh, um, I agree. this um uh this I can't even remember what it's called now. This <laughs> two point this this is messed up. Two point boundary value problem is linear if you can write it in this form. So, right, we have the uh, second derivative plus some coefficient function times the first derivative plus some coefficient times the function equals some function only of x. Okay, so we can see clearly this is uh, a linear form in some way. Um, and then we have the two conditions here. Okay, so basically, uh, we can rearrange so if we take for the first and second derivative, we use these um, differentiation matrices we just saw. And we have um, this matrix is a diagonal of the um, P's, P of X's. Then we can rewrite in this system where the dimension is N plus one, the number of nodes. So essentially instead of X here, for each of these elements, we have a node. So we have x0 through xn plus 1. Um, we have some, I mean, if we if r of x is only known at x, then we know. We can just calculate this because r of x will be a known function to us. We can calculate the output. Um, this is sort of, you know, your response. And then we don't know the value of the function at those x's. So we want to know the value of the function u at the nodes that we calculated the response. So again, co-location. The nodes uh, where we're evaluating the function are the same nodes that we're evaluating this response and the same nodes for calculating p and q. Okay, so. Um, and we, instead of having the derivatives here, we replace it with the finite. The, well, it doesn't have to be finite differencing. You can do the spectral difference, dif the spectral differentiation as well. Um, so whatever 
differentiation matrix you would want here. Does that make sense? Okay, and then um, we want to use the boundary problem. So essentially, I, I mean, this is kind of a little bit verbose, but they say you can create this deletion matrix E that um, takes away the first and last uh, rows of L. And then um, these are the uh, vectors that only have a one. So this has a one at the zero position and zero everywhere else. So it just picks up the first element, right? So the first node um, is equal to alpha and the last node is equal to beta. So your first and last nodes are um, the boundaries. And then they say in the code, well, you know, you don't, we don't actually care about the deletion matrix, just subset it out, just use the indexing. It's like, okay, yeah. So if, if I, if this were me, I would have just uh, defined L and R. I would have just indexed it and I wouldn't have even defined E or any of that. Um, but okay, we, we get the point. So we have a system of linear equations. We can use the tools we know from earlier in the book. Okay, so there's this demo here. We have a linear two uh, parameter boundary, two, what a two point boundary value problem. I'm never going to get it. Okay. Um, and so there's a specific format. You have to define uh, the coefficient functions to use. They have a function here boundary value problem linear, BVP linear. So we have to define all of our coefficient functions as functions. So again, notice that our response function is a constant zero, but we still define it as a function. Okay, then for this boundary value problem linear, we give these uh, coefficient and response functions, the domain, and then the um, boundary, these one and one over E, and then this is how many nodes we want. Um, so 30 nodes, or I guess it'll be 31, you know, the whole plus one thing. Okay, and then we get out um, the node set and then the value of the function. They give us the exact solution so we can look at what this looks like. Um, this is just the demo, so this is all copied. So the exact is the blue. The orange is the solution from the linear system, the LU equals R. And then here is the error. So again, at the boundaries, we have zero error because we gave the um, conditions at the boundaries. So it's only in the middle that we're going to have some non-zero um, error. Looks pretty good. Okay. Okay, yeah, and that's from the book. Um, okay. So um, accuracy and stability. Now we're looking at this linear system as a function of lambda. And um, let's see, we're looking at different values for the number of nodes. So as we increase the number of nodes, what happens to our accuracy? So we have this table. So for every um, 10 order, we reduce uh, by 10. I think was what, what they said, yeah. Okay, and if we plot that, um, we have log log. So um, we have this log log order two convergence, second order convergence. And one more thing. They, I think I wrote it down, maybe not, okay. Basically, um, it, the, what did, they, what was the sentence that they said? Oh, no, it was in a different, oh, wait. Do you know, what what is the reason for the word collocation? I have no idea, actually. Um, Okay, yeah, this is what they said. So basically, um, the errors vanish at the same rate of the truncation error 
um, as you decrease the gap between the notes. So that's pretty, I thought I had written that in here, but whatever. Um, I don't know why it's called co-location. Um, I don't know how you would um I guess, I, guess I don't know what the opposite of co-location is. <laughs> like is there a setting where you're evaluating the function at locations that you didn't observe? I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. I have to look into it. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I guess what it says here, it says it's we're imposing the approximations at certain nodes where you, all, all the same, all the same co-located nodes, I guess that's why, it's, right? We're only enforcing this yeah. solution at the nodes, nowhere else. Okay. Okay. I guess it's a term of art type thing, right? Yeah. Okay, so here's an exercise for this section. Um, there's this airy equation. Okay, um, it just looks like this. Its solution uh, for x greater than zero is exponential and then it's oscillatory for x less than zero. Then they say the exact solution is, a, is basically this linear system here where these are functions um, that you can just call in Julia area. It's funny to call, those, call that exact solution because those functions are, you know, only going to be normally <laughs> approximated and they're just defined as solutions to that equation. So, you know, <laughs> exactly in what sense, but okay, yeah. Uh, okay, so because they gave us this solution, uh, we can solve just based on the two boundary value settings. So essentially, right, right. you have regression, regression with n equals two. Okay, so set up a two by two linear system to find the coefficients, C1 and C2, right? So we have um, the locations are minus one and two. The, um, the response is minus one and one. And then the I'm talking about this like in regression terms here. The co covariates, right, are area AI of X and area VI of X. And then you just solve for the coefficients, right. um, L backslash B. And then we have now the exact is this C1 times area AI, C2 times area BI. And we plot it and we have what they described, right, oscillating for less than zero and then sort of exponential. Uh, as it goes to the right of zero. And yeah, like you said, this is because we're just calling these area AI functions. <laughs> um, it's doing all that. Okay. Now it says use the boundary value problem linear function with 120 nodes and then pl also plot the finite difference um, solution and its error. Okay. So here, are my coefficient functions. The first derivative coefficient function is zero. The second, the function coefficient, all right, let me go up here, right? So there's no first derivative in this system. So it's zero. This is, we have to move it to the left. So minus X is the coefficient function for this component. And then the response function is zero. Okay, so we have those three functions. We have the domain, we have the um, boundary value constants, and the number of nodes, 120. Okay, and it says that for 120, the solution will not be very accurate. Okay, so um, it has a similar shape, but it's not the same uh, magnitude peak size. And then the error, again, at the boundaries is zero and everywhere in between it gets to move around. 
Okay, so look here at the magnitude. We have from minus five to five. And when we repeat with 800 nodes, um, it gets better. Uh, and the magnitude goes down dramatically. Uh, but I guess this is just illustrating. I'm not really sure that you need a lot of nodes, <laughs> even though um, with this exact solution, we could solve it uh, with just two locations, just with the boundary. I don't really know what, I think that's what this is saying. Yeah, you would think 120 nodes would be enough. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you didn't know that there was a solution, you'd probably be like, oh, that's probably good. So I guess you try, you know, what you're supposed to do is like do more nodes and see if it changes, right? So. Okay, so this is the uh, co-location. You estimate your error. Like we did before. <laughs> we did that before the other things. We, you estimate the error by doubling the number of nodes and taking the difference. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then the next section then is, okay, what if we have a nonlinear system? Well, we will just make it be linear. <laughs> well, but now instead of um, instead of this being our linear system of equations, this L, we have defined like this. So we have um, the second difference minus. Um, are you and then now we have our boundary conditions here okay um, and we just use this as our linear system I don't know did I have a anyway okay um well, it's not linear it's not linear well you're no, gonna no, use like not. you can use like root finding things to try to find the solution out. yeah yeah so yeah I spoke too soon, <laughs> um, but yeah. the approach is the same as the co-location approach. So we replace our functions by vectors. We replace derivatives yeah. by differentiation yeah. matrices. And then uh, once we set up this nonlinear system, we use a quasi-Newton method um, to solve for optimization at zero. So basically everything in here should be equal to zero on the right. So we have this minus R over here. Okay, and then one special case. So remember that uh, exercise with the epsilon? Okay, so we have to initialize our quasi-Newton method. We have to initialize um, the values um, of U. We're trying to find U at the nodes, remember. So we initialize U everywhere. And then um, we do our quasi-Newton method until it stops. This is saying that sometimes you have a parameter in your system that is hard. Um, right. For example, like this epsilon, what you do is you do uh, a sequence of that parameter where you initialize using the previous values um, final estimation. Okay, so you pick an easier value of the parameter to optimize that, and then you use that to initialize, you change the parameter, you run it again until you get to the one that you um, care about the most, I guess. Okay. So here is an exercise that I have to show you in my terminal because I was having issues here. So we have this system by this guy, Carrier, Okay, um, again, we have this parameter epsilon, and it says that um, there's issues as u divided by epsilon goes to zero. Okay, and we care about this small value of epsilon 0 0.003. So the first step is just initialize your solution at all zeros, uh, run the function, plot the result. And then it says we have nine local maxima. So this part works fine. Um, I have my domain epsilon. Here I'm going back to we're defining phi in G1 and G2. Okay, and here's the solution with the nine maxima. Okay, and then the 
um, parts B and C are essentially do the parameter uh, tempering or whatever in reverse and then do it back the other way. So do it from a small value of epsilon to a larger and then do it from the larger to the smaller. And I have to show this in the terminal because I was having issues in our markdown with this one for some reason. Okay, so. Put down grades. Okay, here. Oh, I did learn one trick that I can share. So, um, oh, let me, well, you can't really tell my trick because I changed the code. Let me just put it right down. Okay. Um, so uh, we have seen a little bit, I, I don't know, Ron, if this come up in that book, other book you're reading about the global and local definition of variables in Julia. So when you do a for loop, you can have variables that are only locally defined. Um, and then after the for loop, you can't actually access them. So I found a I read a trick. Um, if you define the variable globally first, then it will um, save over the global definition. Okay, so um, here, this was my, I see this trick is that I initialize this variable globally so that I, I can access it later. Okay, so epsilon. Um, is on this grid. I don't, and then we're going to plot. Uh, oh, this is not right. I think I, oh, I forgot to define all of these using the wrong function. Okay. Okay. Okay, so this is now the solution with epsilon equals 0.3. Um, it's just a quadratic. Um, and let me maybe illustrate what I mean by this global local thing. Um, so here now we're doing it reverse the other way. Okay. So if I maybe say this is UX, I don't have a UX anywhere. It will give me an error. That says UX is not defined because it only gets defined locally here in the for loop. Um, if I say UX equals init, the initializer outside, then run the for loop then I have access to UX. Does that make sense? Okay. And so this is saying, look, this is what our solution should have been with that small epsilon that we initialized at zero instead of the nine local maximum. It should just be this sort of quadrant bowl. Okay. Um, yeah. And our markdown. There's, there's also a key, global keyword you can use too. So if you okay inside that loop, you could say global UX. Kind of a pain though. You have to you still have to write another line somewhere. So it is as well to do what you did. <laughs> Make yourself yeah. clear. Declare. You got to okay. declare it as a global. Okay. Um, good to know. Okay. I think I would do it the way you did it though. That's the way I got an impression from when I when I was reading on the Julia documentation. Well, it's cool. That yeah. was the impression I got. Yeah. The way to do it. I don't know what the the, the recommended Julia way is. I think it's the way you did it, probably. Okay, so that was 
linear and nonlinear using differentiation matrices. Um, so the last section is this Gal Galerkin method. So instead of doing differentiation, Galerkin does integration. And unfortunately, the notation all changes, but um, so essentially you, we integrate um, on both sides, all of our coefficient function letters have changed, but there is some, um, these are our coefficient functions now. And F is the R, so it's important. This is the response. Okay, so now you can see we multiplying by this new function psi. Okay, uh, everywhere. And this is a definition, this is called the weak solution. So this says, um, if u of x is a function that satisfies the weak form for all valid psi, then u is a weak solution. It did, I mean, that's just a definition. I didn't really take a whole lot from it. Um, okay, but how do we solve this, right? It looks like we made it even worse for ourselves right. by making integration. <laughs> um, so what we do is we take psi and u um, to be linear uh, basis function expansions. So psi is z i phi i and u is w j phi j. Okay, we plug those in. Now these are our constraints on the system. Okay, and if we take these constraints and put them in matrices k and m, uh, we have this system K is this first part, I believe. This is the stiffness. M is the second part. This is the mass of the equations. We can choose phi i and phi j to be um, whatever we want. And the most common choice for those bases are hat functions. So we saw the hat functions in chapter five. Remember they're um, non-zero everywhere except for um, two locations. Okay. And the hat functions, right? So they're only non-zero at two adjacent intervals. So think of the intervals are defined by the nodes, right? So at um, centered on one node, it'll be non-zero to the left and to the right. This means then now that the integration is local, so this is what we define by finite elements. So essentially, there is an interpretation where if you have the hat functions, the integration basically just boils down to you take the average of the coefficients over the interval and um, divided by the widths and those pieces, those interval in integration over those intervals only affect a finite number of elements in K and M. That's what I understood the finite element to be referring to essentially, right? these integrals only contribute to um, the nodes where the hat functions are non-zero. Okay, so it ends up only being like a square, a two by two a, um, piece of K and N and uh, just a couple locations on F. <clears throat> okay, so integration is local because we have the hat functions. Um, we have second order accuracy maintained if the coefficient functions, we just replace them with the average um, based on the two endpoints. Okay, these spatially localized contributions to the matrices define this, what we call finite element method. Okay, and so there's again this function now, FEM, finite element method, 
we have to change our notation a little bit from before p q and r now we have oh well actually they kept <laughs> they kept the q it's supposed to be c s and f now but they uh they kept the q <laughs> um so these are the coefficient functions okay this is just an example from the book. So we have x squared, four and sine pi times x is the response. The notation is a little bit different here. So you uh, put in the coefficient functions, but now you put in the, uh, I can't remember, the domain and the number of nodes. Okay, and this is the solution by finite elements. Okay. Uh, are there any questions about that? I think I just have one more exercise. Uh, yeah, I had a question. I don't know if they addressed this in the book or not, but this point about the weak solutions, um, I mean, they say in there that every solution to what might call a strong form is a weak solution, but the converse is not always true. So that means that your weak solution might not be a solution to the equation you actually care about. That's why I never quite understood that. It's like, he didn't address that again, right? As far as I know, he was like, eh, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. I, I took it as, it's a solution, but it doesn't, it's not necessarily strong, but I don't know what that, really me me either like and Andrew, did you have a take on that at all andrew said he was having some internet trouble there he's not with us at the moment anyway that was my question i'm not sure maybe maybe uh something to think about later if i <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Not always true. I guess it's it's true enough, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I mean, like I, I, I think this whole question, this whole section, this whole last section was like, wow, what well, do we really need this? <laughs> <laughs> We're almost done with the yeah. chapter. You turn the page, like, oh, what is this? <laughs> that <was my> <laughs> yeah, that's a good reaction. <laughs> I... oh. Okay. Anyway. Um... Yeah. Okay, and I just did one of the parts from exercise 10.6.1. I for this section, most of the exercises are uh, having the little hand sign, so I kind of skipped all of them. Right. Um. So yeah, I just did this, and so we have this two point boundary value problem. And we have to identify the sort of coefficient functions. This kind of took me a little while <laughs> um, because in the Galerkin method, it always has this negative here. So at first I was putting negative when I shouldn't have put negative. And then there's also some weird thing about uh, This is the first, wait, let me go back one more. This is like C times the first derivative. So I wasn't sure if I needed to integrate anyway. I I think I did it okay. We'll see. Proof based on the, uh, results, right? <laughs> <laughs> based on this, I ended up saying that the C, so that goes on this part, coefficient function is one. I couldn't quite decide if it was one or X, but I put one because that one worked and the other one didn't work. Experimental math, I like it. <laughs> um, okay, then F is the coefficient function that goes with this U, which is a one. And then in um, the F then is this all this response. Um, and we don't have to move it over or anything. It's supposed to be on the right side, so. Put it I think here. you're right looking at the uh, equation. It looks like, yeah, C should be one. Okay. So I give my C, S, F, I give the boundaries and then how many nodes? 40. 
So here's my solution by finding elements. Okay, looks like a, I don't know, gamma curve or something. Oh. Okay, yeah. then it gives us the exact solution. Then it says to try n on this grid, which I will um, admit that I Googled this grid because I was like, what is the, it goes 10, 20, 40, 640. And I found out this is a geometric series. <laughs> so <laughs> defined by this. Okay. Yeah. Um, and track the error for each n. And it says the error should be order two. Okay, so um, I have the error here. And it's order two. That's what I found out. I did have a lot of trouble on this one um, with coding it. I don't. Well, you got, got it to work. I got it's, it to work eventually, good. but yeah. I was having a lot of issues with indexing and with error and n and I don't know. But this worked fine for me. Um, and I think, and that's all I got. Oh, and I only have five minutes. Okay, great. Good so, job. I mean, I think uh, you deserve some kudos for getting through this extremely challenging chat. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. I honestly have never seen almost any, I've seen the shooting thing one time. Other than that, I've never seen any of this. I mean, I certainly saw BVPs yeah. before using algorithms, you know, off the shelf stuff, but never the, the guts like that. And yeah, nice, nice job. Yeah. There. Thank you. Um, yeah. Next week, it's uh, Andrew's turn to, right? We're on schedule for next week, I think. Yeah, yeah I'm scheduled for next week. Yeah. yeah. Your turn. Uh, it's, it, it, it's a bit slow. Yeah. What's a bit slow? I didn't understand. Ah, okay. Your internet's a bit slow, I think he means. No worries. Yeah. Well, I think we each have one more turn, right? Yep, that's right. Andrew, then me with the uh, Andrew's doing the diffusion equation i'm doing advection which is basically like wave equation type things and uh you're doing the final two-dimensional super yeah, challenging <laughs> <laughs> probably or maybe it takes it easy us on us at the end but i doubt it <laughs> non-linear elliptic pdes see that'd be, that'd be fun <laughs> oh some nice plots though i scroll through there so yeah Cool. Thanks everyone for hanging in yeah. chapter 10. Yeah, um, we're almost there. We can do it. See you next week. There. Have a good weekend. You too. Bye.